Hi. Welcome to The Sacred Journey. The Sacred Journey is the program that reminds you that life is a wonderful adventure and each and every experience we have is a unique and perfect opportunity for learning. I'm Joyce St. Germain and tonight's program is another one of the Zoom series. So from time to time you will hear me speak to my Zoom audience and maybe make some adjustments. And I'd like to thank um, Kristen from Be Yoga for hosting us this time. So we're doing Native American storytelling. I hope you'll enjoy the stories. Oh, I know. Let's start with a breathing thing. We may be, we've had some busy days the last few days. And it really helps us because we have lungs inside of us. And what do they do? They take in all the wonderful air. And then when the air is in our body, it travels all through our body, everywhere. Right down to our fingertips, right down to our toes, everywhere. And then when we breathe out, we're breathing out all the old stuff that we don't need anymore. We're breathing in all this nice new air. And in the air is a lot of healing things, a lot of special things. So when we breathe that in, our body gets, we, we say nourished. Like when you eat good food, it nourishes your body. Well, when we breathe in good, clean air, it nourishes or it feeds our body. So let's do that now. Let's sit up nice and straight. And we're going to breathe in a lot, but not so much that it hurts. But uh, Like a lot, like this. Breathe in through your nose. Breathe out through your mouth like this. Let's do that again. One more time, in and out. Good job, everybody. You did such a great job with that. I'm going to teach you another breath called breath of joy. Joy is happiness, and I want to breathe in happiness. I want to breathe in joy, don't you? So we're going to sit again, and this time we're going to use our hands, and we're going to breathe in three times and we're going to breathe out once. I'll show you what it sounds like. Okay, let's do it without the hands. Let's go three times in. Try it again. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to inhale up and we're going to move our hands like this. Okay, let's do that again. Good job. Now, on another time, maybe we'll do that standing. And sometimes when you go, you can bend forward. But today we did it an easier way. But I feel happier. I feel good. I hope you do too. I'm ready for stories. I hope you are too. One of my favorite creatures is a spider. And I don't know why, but some people don't like spiders, and I think it's because they don't know about them. Spiders are absolutely wonderful creatures, and I have a story about them. And then I'll tell you a little bit about this picture of the spider. Now, I have somebody that might want to rattle or drum for us, so we'll have some nice sound in the background, my husband Chris. Maybe, Chris, we could have some nice soft drumming. How the spider symbol came to the people. From the earliest days when they came together on this earth, the Osage people have been divided into two groups. These groups were the sky people and the earth people. The nine clans of the sky people always lived in the northern half of the village. The 15 clans of the earth people lived in the southern half of the village. These clans looked to the animals to be their teachers, to serve as symbols for them to live strong lives. Each clan had more than one animal as its symbol. One of those clans was called the isolated earth people. This is the story of how the spider became one of the symbols of that clan.
Now, a clan is a group of people, sometimes they're all related, or sometimes they live together like a family would live together. And a symbol is something that makes you think or reminds you of something else, okay? It's um, something that when you see a butterfly, you may say, oh, that makes me happy. That's a happy symbol. It makes me think of happy things. One day, the chief of the isolated earth people was hunting in the forest. He was not just hunting for game. He was also hunting for a symbol to give life to his people. Some great and powerful animal that would show itself to him and teach him an important lesson. As he hunted, he came upon the tracks of a huge deer. The chief became very excited. Grandfather deer, he said, surely you're going to show yourself to me. You're going to teach me a lesson and become one of the symbols of my people. That's an interesting picture. Let's see what happens. Then the chief began to follow the deer's tracks. His eyes were on nothing else as he followed those tracks, and he went faster and faster through the forest. Suddenly, the chief ran right into a huge spider's web that had been strung between the trees across the trail. It was so large and so strong that it covered his eyes and made him stumble. When he got back up to his feet, he was very angry. He struck at the spider, which was sitting at the edge of the web. But the spider dodged aside and climbed out of reach. Then the spider spoke to the man. Grandson, the spider said, why do you run through the woods looking at nothing but the ground? Why do you act as if you are blind? The chief felt foolish, but he felt he had to answer the spider. I was following the tracks of the great deer, the chief said. I'm seeking a symbol to give life and strength to my people. I can be such a symbol, said the spider. How could you give strength to my people, said the chief. You're small and weak, and I didn't even see you as I followed the great deer. Grandson, said the spider, look upon me. I am patient. I watch and I wait. Then all things come to me. If your people learn this, they will be strong indeed. The chief saw that it was so. Thus, the spider became one of the symbols of the Osage people. So this, we'll look at that picture again. This chief was so busy looking at the ground that there was something really wonderful right in front of him and he didn't even notice it. So it's good for us to learn to look down and up and all around because there's some wonderful things to see everywhere. And I told you that I would tell you a little bit about this spider. This spider has four colors on it, red, yellow, black, and white. Those are the colors of all kinds of corn. There is actually corn where the kernels are red, black, yellow, and white. Not all on one, um, uh, not when they're cooked, I should say, or when they're popped. But the kernels can be all of these colors, and there's something very special about that. All of these colors represent all races of people. Isn't that wonderful? The white is all people whose ancestors, or their grandfathers and great-grandfathers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers and great-great-great-great-great-grandmothers and grandfathers came from Europe. And the red from all the Americas. The yellow from Asia and the black from Africa. So everyone has a very special place. And we call this the medicine wheel. Not medicine like when you're sick, you take medicine that your mom or dad might give you, but medicine of it's good for us to know and good for us to learn about. And if we look very, very closely, we'll see some red dots right here, a little row of red dots. Those are called the ancestor dots. They remind us 
that there were many generations, meaning grandparents and great-grandparents and great-great-great-grandparents and a lot before us, and there'll be some after us, like grandchildren and great-grandchildren, well, children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, great-great-great-grandchildren. And it reminds us that there is a wonderful, wonderful, we call that a lineage, wonderful family history and family story. So the spider is very important in my life because I really like what it teaches me. So this is a symbol of a spider. It's not a real spider. It's painted on here. So this is a symbol of the spider, and it reminds me, because it has the medicine wheel, that we're all connected. We all make up the medicine wheel, and we're all very important, equally important. Okay, let's find another great story. I hope you're feeling great after that wonderful breathing breath of joy. I am. Oh, look at that. We were just talking about butterflies. How the butterflies came to be. Where I live, the butterflies aren't out yet, but they'll be out pretty soon as soon as it gets nice and warm. And maybe we could have a little bit of rattling for this story. Long ago, not long after, Earthmaker shaped the world out of dirt and sweat. He scraped from his skin. Etoy, our elder brother, was walking about. It was just after the time of year when the rains come. There were flowers blooming all around him as he walked. The leaves of the trees were green and bright. He came to a village, and there he saw children playing. Then he became sad. He thought of how those children would grow old and weaken and die. That was the way it was made to be. The red and yellow and white and blue of the flowers would fade. The leaves would fall from the trees. The days would grow short, and the nights would be cold. A wind rushed past Elder Brother, making some fallen yellow leaves dance in the sunlight. Then an idea came to him. I will make something, Elder Brother said. It will make the hearts of the children dance and it will make my own heart glad again. Then Etoy took a bag and placed it in the bright colored flowers in the fallen leaves. He placed many things in that. Could we have just softer rattling just a little bit? Thank you. He placed them in the bag. He placed yellow pollen and white cornmeal and green pine needles in that bag. And he caught some of the shining gold of the sunlight and he placed it in there as well. There were birds singing around him and he took some of their songs and he put them into that bag too. Come here, elder brother called to the children. Come here, I have something for you. The children came to him and he handed his bag. Open this, he said. The children opened Elder's bag and out of it flew the first butterflies. Their wings were bright as sunlight and held all the colors of the flowers and the leaves, the cornmeal, the pollen, and the green pine needles. They were red and gold and black and yellow, blue and green and white. They looked like flowers dancing in the wind. They flew about the heads of the children, and the children laughed. As those first butterflies flew, they sang, and the children listened. But as the children listened to the singing butterflies, the songbirds came to Elder Brother. Etoy, the songbird, said, Those songs were given to us. It's fine that you've given these new creatures all the brightest colors, but it's not right that they should also have our songs. Ah, Elder Brother said, you speak truly. The songs belong to you and not to the butterflies. So it is to this day. Though they dance as they fly, the butterflies are silent. But still, when the children see them brightly dancing in the wind, their hearts are glad. That is how Elder Brother meant it to be. So the next time you see a butterfly, 
And think of the story that they used to be able to sing and then they went, hmm, maybe that's not fair because we get to be so beautiful and we have beautiful wings and all these beautiful colors. We don't need those beautiful songs too. We'll let the, the songbirds have the beautiful songs. This is kind of a little bit funny, but it teaches us an important lesson. Why possum has a naked tail? And a naked tail is one that I guess doesn't have any fur on it. Let's read and find out. Let's see if we can find a picture of a possum. There he is. There's the possum. He does have a naked tail. Let's see if we can find out why. In the old days, possum had the most beautiful tail of all the animals. It was covered with long, silky hair, and possum liked nothing better to wave it around when the animal people met together in council. Council means when you sit together, sometimes in a circle, and you share ideas, and everyone listens politely, and everyone speaks politely and everyone cooperates, everyone gets along. He would hold up his tail and show it off to the animal people. You see my tail, he would say. Is it not the most beautiful tail you have ever seen? Surely it is finer than any other animals. He was so proud of his tail that the other animals became tired of hearing him brag about it. Finally, Rabbit decided to do something about it. Rabbit was the messenger for the animals, and he was the one who always told them when there was to be a council meeting. He went to Possum's house. My friend, Rabbit said, there's going to be a great meeting. Our chief bear wants, to, wants you to sit next to him in council. He wants you to be the first one to speak because you have such a beautiful tail. There's the rabbit and the bear. Mm -mm, that possum. Possum was flattered. It is true, he said. One who has such a beautiful and perfect tail as I have should be the first one to speak in council. He held up his tail, combing it with his long fingers. Is not my tail the most wonderful thing you have ever seen? Rabbit looked close at possum's tail. My friend Rabbit said, it seems to me as if your tail is just a little bit dirty. I think it would look even better if you would allow me to clean it. I have some special medicine that will make your tail look just the way it should look. Possum looked close at his tail. It did seem as if it was a little bit dirty. Yes, Possum said, that is a good idea. I want all the animals to admire my tail when I speak in council. Then Rabbit mixed up his medicine. It was very strong, so strong that it loosened all the hair on Possum's tail. But as he put the medicine on Possum's tail, he wrapped the tail in the skin which had been shed by a snake. Oh, maybe my helper would go up and get the the frame that we have in the living room that has a snake skin in it, so you can see it's pretty special. This snake skin will make sure the medicine works well, Rabbit said. Do not take it off until you speak in council tomorrow. Then the people will all see your tail, just as it should be seen. Possum did as Rabbit said. He kept the snake skin wrapped tightly around his tail all through the night. Let's see what happened. The next day when the animals met for council, Possum sat next to Chief Bear. As soon as the meeting began, he stood up to speak. As he spoke, he walked back and forth, swinging his tail, which was wrapped in the snakeskin. He smiled as he thought of how good his tail would look because of the medicine Rabbit had put on it. All the animals were watching him very closely looking at his tail. Possum grinned at the thought of how beautiful his tail would look. The time was right. 
My friends, Possum said, holding up his tail and beginning to unwrap the snakeskin. I have been chosen to start this council because of my tail. It is the finest of all the tails. Look at my beautiful tail. Possum pulled off the snakeskin wrapping, and as he did so, all the hair fell off his tail. His tail was naked and ugly, and when Possum saw it, the grin froze on his face. All of the animals were looking at him. Possum was so ashamed that he fell down on the ground and pretended to be dead. He did not move until long after all the other animals had gone. To this day, Possum still has that foolish grin on his face. And whenever he feels threatened, whenever he thinks he might get hurt, he pretends that he's dead. And because he was so vain, Possum has the ugliest tail of all the animals. Vain means you think that you're better than everybody is. And nobody's better than everybody. Nobody's better than anybody is. We're all pretty special in our own way. Now this is a snake skin in glass and snakes shed their skin. What they do is they wiggle out of the skin and it doesn't hurt them because now the skin is dead and what their new skin is brand new and healthy. So this is what the rabbit wrapped around the possum's tail with medicine in it to teach him that it wasn't very nice. Put that down so that doesn't break. It wasn't very nice for him to think that he was better than all the other animals. And we have time for one more, I think. And we'll do this again, too. This is a nice one. A fawn is a baby deer. And this is how the fawn got its spots. And a baby deer has little spots on his fur. So let's see why and how. Long ago, when the world was new, Wonkin Tonka, the great mystery, Wonkin Tonka is another word for all that is, or kind of like God, or something really, really, really special. Wonkin Tonka, the great mystery, was walking around. As he walked, he spoke to himself of the many things he had done to help the four-legged ones and the birds survive. The four-leggeds are the animals that have four legs. It is good, Wonkin Tonka said. I have given mountain lion sharp claws and grizzly bear great strength. It is much easier now for them to survive. I've given wolf sharp teeth and I've given his little brother coyote quick wits. It is much easier now for them to survive. I've given beaver a flat tail and webbed feet to swim beneath the water and teeth which can cut down the trees. And I've given slow moving porcupine quills to protect itself. Now it is easier for them to survive. I have given the birds their feathers and the ability to fly so that they may escape their enemies. I've given speed to the deer and the rabbit so that it will be hard for their enemies to catch them. Truly, it is now much easier for them to survive. However, as Wonkin Tonka spoke, a mother deer came up to him. Behind her was her small fawn, wobbling on weak new legs. I think he was just born. Great one, she said, it is true. You have given many gifts to the four-leggeds and the winged ones. Who are the winged ones? birds. To help them survive, it is true that you gave me great speed and now my enemies find it hard to catch me. My, ski, my speed is a great protection indeed. But what of my little one here? She does not yet have speed. It is easy for our enemies with their sharp teeth and their claws to catch her. If my children do not survive, how can my people live? Wika Yako Pilo said Wakantanka, you've spoken truly. You are right. Have your little one come here and I will help her. Then Wonkin Tonka made paint from the earth and the plants. He painted spots upon the fawn or the baby deer's body so that when she lay still, her color blended in with the earth 
and she could not be seen. Then Wonkatunka breathed upon her, taking away her scent. Her scent is how you smell. Like if you put perfume on that smells like roses, then your scent is like roses. If you have an herb like sage, then your scent might be sage. Now Wonkin Tonka said, your little ones will always be safe if they only remain still when they're away from your side. None of your enemies will see your little ones or be able to catch their scent. So it has been from that day on. When a young deer is too small and weak to run swiftly, it is covered with spots that blend in with the earth. It has no scent and it remains very still and close to the earth when its mother is not by its side. And when it has grown enough to have the speed, Wankintanka gave its people, then it loses those spots it once needed to survive. So, baby deer have those little spots, so if they stay very, very, very still, and because they don't have any scent, other animals that might want to catch them won't even know they're there. So that's a really pretty cool story, I think, of why the baby deer have spots, and when they get older, they don't need the spots, because they can run really fast, and they can escape and keep safe. So I wanted to show you one more thing. You know, we talked a lot about spider. And in the spider's body, I'm gonna hold it up for our other friends that are watching this on TV can see, it is the night sky. So that reminds me that Maybe the night sky could be a big spider's body. Maybe. I don't know. Kind of fun to think about that it might be. But there's some special magic about a spider. And when spiders weave their webs, they don't get stuck in their own webs. Little insects do because the spider needs to eat, and that's the spider's food. Because, hmm, I'm going to try to show you this spider web right up here. If we look at that spider's web, these spokes or lines are sticky. The ones that go around, I mean, are not sticky. The ones that go around and around are sticky. So these are not sticky, so the spider stays on those with his feet so he doesn't get stuck, or she doesn't get stuck. And the other insects that are going to be the meals, the food for the spider, they just get stuck in the ones that go around and around and around, and the spider's pretty smart, so he steps and walks only on those straight lines, only on those spokes. That's pretty clever, isn't it? And spider web is so very, 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 very strong that one little strand, you couldn't even break it. And we wouldn't want to anyway. We want the spiders to have their webs so that they can continue to be spiders. So I had such a wonderful time with you. I hope you'll join me next week and we'll do some more Native American stories and some more drumming and rattling and breathing. But I want to thank all of you for joining us. And I'm going to say goodbye to our television people and say thanks for joining us on The Sacred Journey. We'll catch you next time.